Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday ladies meeting at Bethel Christian Center, at the church at Bethel Christian Center, which is Bethel Christian Church. We're glad that you're tuning in this morning. For those that are here, it's just wonderful to see your happy faces. And I hope that we can have some more ladies even next week. Pastor Margie and Mandy both had a situation come up, and neither one of them could be here today. So you're just going to have to deal with me. I'm Pastor Rhonda. I'm the associate pastor here at Bethel. And this is my dear friend, Holly Leary. She is a, is she on, Mary? Go ahead and turn her on. She is a licensed marriage and family counselor, and she's taken care of me for many years because we're not quite the same age. Iron sharpens iron. Yes, iron sharpens iron. Is she on, Mary? Check. Can you check her mic again? Can I what? Check your mic again. I don't know what to do. Is she on in the... I can't hear her. Can you guys hear her out there? Nope. Nope. There oh. she is. Oh, there you are. I feel very on. Very on now. <laughs> okay. Can we... Well, scoot apart. Feedback and okay. All right, well, this then. is new to both of us, so here we are. <laughs> okay. Well, Holly's gonna go sit down now, oh. and I am gonna start off this morning, and then she is going to come up and minister according to what I said and what the Lord is showing her. So let's start off with the word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you that you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. You have given us life. You have planned us. You knew that we would exist, and you sent Jesus to die just for each one of us. And now our well-being is your number one priority because you gave your very self so that you could be in fellowship with us. I pray your blessing on this message today, on what Holly has to say, and that everyone who is here and everyone who is listening will get this deep into their spirits so that it can be used for their benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. So today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day for me to be a child of the King. Today is the day for me to be beloved by my Father, to be cherished, to be treasured, to be precious in His sight. Today is the day for me to be led by the Holy Spirit in everything I do and say and think so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are acceptable in His sight. Today is the day that I have the wisdom of the Lord to speak a word in season to one who is weary, to bring the word of God and the love of Jesus to the people who are broken, to help bind up the wounds, to help bring healing to broken hearts, to help people to rise above circumstances. That's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have a Bible, if you would go to the book of Philippians, in the New Testament, we're going to go through one of my favorite chapters, and this is Philippians chapter 4, and I'll be reading today out of the New King James Version, and I may switch over to Amplified because I like the Amplified too. This is the Apostle Paul. He's talking to the church at Philippi. The Christians at Philippi were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. They were Greeks. They were of Greek nationality. And they had this, um, they, a lot of them were very poor. And as we go along, we're going to keep that in mind. Understanding the Apostle Paul was once a Jewish scholar. His name was Saul. And he was so against this whole idea that Jesus was teaching about faith rather than keeping the law that he would arrest Christians and be complicit in them being condemned to death. And I don't know how many Christians he arrested. I don't know how many people he was able to sentence to death because of their faith in Christ. But he had a conversion experience. He was on the road to Damascus, which is in Syria, to arrest Christians there and drag them back to Jerusalem for trial. And as he was riding along, this blinding light appeared. And Paul, it says, fell off his horse as if he were dead. And he heard a voice and it said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And he said, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. That is so telling because when we are persecuted, because we are followers of Christ, we aren't the ones being persecuted. Jesus is being persecuted. For everything that we endure, because we are Christians, this is not something that Jesus, oh well, you can handle it. No, he feels it just like we do. It hurts him, just like it hurts us. And he wants us to stand in faith against it and just go on with what we're doing in life. And sometimes that is so hard. But what Paul was saying to the church at Philippi, which is one that he founded, he said, Be, I'm sorry, therefore my beloved and longed for brethren. Brethren just means family. We'll just substitute the word family today, shall we? My beloved and longed for family, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Now then he talked to two women that were in the church, Iodia and Sintiki. Aren't you glad that's not your name? I implore Iodia and I implore Sintiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, he was addressing the pastor of the church, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So what does this tell us? That there were conflicts in the church even in Paul's time. That people who loved the Lord, loved the Lord, they were co-laborers for the gospel, and they didn't get along. So Paul was telling the pastor of this church, it probably wasn't a church like this, it might have been a sanctuary building, but more likely it was in a home. There were homes that sometimes would have a large meeting room, and they could have been in there. But he was telling these two women, you need to get along, and telling the pastor, help them. Apparently, they were instrumental in getting this church started. If you're familiar with the name Lydia, Lydia was a Gentile woman, and she was a seller of purple. That means she was a wealthy businesswoman, and Paul used her to start the church in her hometown. Sometimes we get so caught up with when the Bible talks about women being silent in the church, and we totally and completely misinterpret that whole thing. Ladies, you are important to the kingdom of God. You are important to the church. You are important to the laboring of the gospel, to the witnessing, and to the ministry. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it because you're a woman. It's just not true. So these two ladies were having an issue. He told them to get along, and then he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, if you happen to see our sermon on Sunday, Pastor Mike was teaching rejoice literally means to spin in a circle for joy. To spin in a circle. And he spun in a circle. And then he was dizzy. So he went back the other way so that he could get his brain unscrambled. Rejoice in the Lord. Remembering this about Paul, he was put in prison. He had stones thrown at him until he died and was raised from the dead. He was beaten with rods. He was beaten with whips. He was shipwrecked. All of these things happened to him. And here this guy says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. With all of those circumstances in his life, with all of those trials that he had to go through, he said, rejoice. Then he said, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Understanding that this was the guy that when he would start a church, he would go first to the Jewish synagogue that was there. And if you had 10 Jewish men in a town, you could have a synagogue. And he would talk to them and he would show them in the Old Testament scriptures, look, this is Jesus. All of these prophecies led to him. 
This is the guy we've been looking for. He didn't, he's not coming here to save us from the Romans. He is coming here to save us from the sins that we've committed under this old system. The old system was a performance-based system. If you did what God wanted you to do, then you would be blessed. But in the Jesus system, in the grace system, we are blessed. So we can do what he wants us to do. He equips us to do it. It's not us trying to be perfect so that we can get his love and his favor. We already have his love and his favor on us. So we are free. We are free. We don't have to let anything hold us back anymore. The Lord is at hand. Then be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about anything. Oh, to get that into my head. To make myself stop worrying. Anybody in here ever worry? No, nobody worries? Okay, all right. If only we could get ourselves to stop worrying. So Paul says, be anxious for nothing. So you know what that tells me? I can stop worrying. And here's how. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. In everything, by prayer and supplication. A supplication means you keep at it. Not because you're trying to make God do it. You know why we repeat prayers? Do you know why we, we keep asking, we keep praying, we keep pushing? It's not to make God move. It's to make us feel better. I was reading something from Dr. Caroline Leaf. She is an expert in, in the brain and how the brain works. And she was saying that whatever it is that our brains are trying to process, speaking it out, speaking it out makes the brain process it. But we have to speak out the right thing. I say, tell someone your troubles once. Tell God every time it bothers you, but always come back with thanksgiving. Always come back with thanksgiving. Okay, Lord, I've got some issues. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. This is really bothering me. I don't like what so-and-so said. I don't like what's going on in the government. Um, I'm not feeling well. I don't know exactly what to do, but I thank you, Lord that you have provided the answer for me, that you take care of me, that you are my shepherd, that I will not lack because of you. I will not want that you lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Thank you, Lord, that by the stripes of Jesus, I am already healed. And thank you, Lord, just for the fact that you exist and that you made me because you loved me already. Just the way I am, without any improvement, without any self-help books, just the way I am right now, he loves me. And no matter how great I get, he won't love me any more than he does right now. And if I go down into the dumps, if I totally turn my back on him, he will not love me any less than he does right now. Wow. That's amazing. And it says that when we do this, when we give him our requests by prayer and, thanks, and supplication with thanksgiving, then, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's how we get rid of worry. We give it to God. We give the worry to God. We rejoice in the fact that we are saved, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that no matter what's going on in this world, he is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. No matter what we need, he already provided it for us. So we rejoice. We are thankful. We give our worries to the Lord, and then, then we are at peace. Then we go on, finally, family, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, 
And if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate means to go over it and over it and over it. Another word is ruminate. A ruminate is like a cow that chews its cud. Chew on it. Think about the things that are good in this life. If you, that means you can't watch the news, turn the news off. If that means you can't hear all the problems from everybody around you, find a way to avoid listening to everybody else's issues. Like I said, you say it once, let them say it once, but don't let them keep putting their stuff into your mind because you'll keep thinking about it. You'll ponder it. To meditate means even to speak it out. Now, what is true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report? The word, the good news of the gospel. I don't have to save myself. I don't have to die for my sins. I don't have to be sick. I don't have to be in poverty. I don't have to be held down. Jesus took everything. Everything that the enemy could throw at me, Jesus took it upon himself. And he, he took it on the cross, and it made him unacceptable in the sight of Father God. So all the rejection that we feel that God must feel toward us and how he rejects us, no. He rejected Jesus. Jesus was rejected so that we don't have to be. Even if the entire world rejects us, God accepts exactly who we are. Wow, I got a little happy there. Let me figure out where I am. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. That is a bold statement. For Paul to say, what I taught you, what I did, you do that too. In another place, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That is bold. But that's someone who is very, very confident in his relationship with the Lord to know that he is being led by the Spirit. And he is following after whatever it is that the Lord wants him to do. And I want to be like that. I want to be like that. So that people can look at my life and say, she really trusts the Lord. She really follows the Lord. And the peace of God, God of peace, will be with you. The God of peace. So now we've talked about the peace that passes understanding, the peace that doesn't make any sense, and God is with us, and he will bring peace to every situation we encounter. Now, this is an interesting section here. But I rejoiced in the Lord great, greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. What he's saying is they used to support him, and then they couldn't for a while, and now they were again. And that happens sometimes. Sometimes we give to ministries, and then something happens, and we can't. But the minute we can again... We get right out there and we, we support those ministries again. And what he was saying was, I'm not glad you're doing this for my sake. He goes on and says, I know how to be abased, which means very poor. And I know how to abound, meaning having enough and even more. I know how, I'm sorry, everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Anyone in here ever suffer need? Ever have a need? Anybody in here not know when you're, you were, were going to get your next meal or you didn't know how you were going to get somewhere because you didn't have any gas money or maybe you didn't even have a car or maybe you didn't have a job or maybe you didn't even have a place to live, but the Lord provided. He always provides. And it may not be perfect and it may not be the way that we always want it, and a lot of times it does require that we step out in faith. We take a step out in faith and then, son of a gun, if the situation doesn't just work out by itself, it's always the Lord. So to abound and to suffer need, and then we know this next scripture really well. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If we look at it in this regard, that scripture is specifically talking about being able to survive even when your circumstances are dire. Now, people use this for everything, and it applies to everything. Christian schools use it for their sports programs. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, in sports, I don't believe that's true. I could not run a mile, no matter how much you paid me. Well, at least I'd have to train for it for, I don't know, five or six years ahead of time or something. But it's saying, I can flourish in famine. I can survive in sickness. I can keep going when everything looks like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I can keep going. But let's go back in this. Let's go back to verse 9. Can you do that, Mary? If I can do all things through Christ, that means I can follow, I can imitate someone who's imitating the Lord. It also means verse 8. I can keep my mind on things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report and virtue. Then go back to 6. I can be anxious for nothing. I can make myself stop worrying. I can remember to take everything to God in prayer and supplication, to give him thanks so that I can have the peace of God. Let's go back to verse 4. I can rejoice in the Lord always. I can. And in verse 5, I can let my gentleness be known to all people. I can do this. I can do this. If we go up all the way, I can get along with everyone in the church, even if I don't like them, even if they are not nice to me, even if they're grumpy, even if I don't think they're doing a good job, I can still get along with them. I can still work with those people to preach the gospel, to further the kingdom of God. And I can stand fast in the Lord, which is verse 1. Now let's go back down. You like how he did that? He took that, made it everything. Let's go on. This is verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel... When I departed from Macedonia, that's a, an area of Greece, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. He wasn't wanting them to support him so that he could prosper. He wanted them to give to him because of the fruit that would abound to his account. Jesus himself said that if you give a cup of cold water to a child in the name of Jesus, he said that if you will take care of a prophet, if you will take care of someone, of an evangelist, if you will bring your tithes and your offerings to the storehouse of the Lord, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. We want you to be blessed. Those that are in ministry want nothing more than for you to thrive in the Lord. For you to have enough not only to meet your own needs, but to bless those around you. That's what we want. We want it for ourselves, but we want it for you. Anything we want for ourselves that is good, we want for you. If we're not like that, we shouldn't be in ministry. But I promise you, that is what we want. Let's go on. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full 
having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Well-pleasing to God. Not well-pleasing to Paul. Well-pleasing to God. That even in their circumstances, which were not the greatest, they were able to pool their resources and share some with him so that he could keep going, that he could go into other countries and other nations and other cities so that he could preach the gospel there. And then, here's another scripture we all know, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Have you put your faith in Christ Jesus? Then the riches of heaven are yours. The riches of heaven. What does God own? The Old Testament says he owns the cattle on, on a thousand hills. He owns every cow on the face of the earth. He owns every person. He owns the earth itself. Broaden your mind and think of the solar system. He owns the sun. He owns our moon. He owns every planet. He owns every star. So sometimes we, we get a little jealous. If someone else is really well blessed by God, sometimes ministers on TV, they preach this, and then they actually have the audacity to live it. They actually have the audacity to drive nice cars and to have nice houses. And other people, well, they're just, they just want some money and speak against them. I will not speak against a Christian minister. Because there's another scripture in Isaiah. It says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And if I speak against a Christian minister, I am the weapon that isn't going to prosper. God has plenty if he gives Holly a million dollars, he's got a million dollars to give you too. But if she gets a million dollars, I would guess that it's because she followed the leading of the Lord and stood in faith for it and gave of her substance. Because I know her. She gives and gives and gives. And the Lord responds and blesses her abundantly. Everything that you get, I have no jealousy for. You ever see on Facebook somebody puts up something nice that they got and someone always puts, must be nice. Must be nice. Ooh, what a bitter statement. Or they go to Hawaii and it's, I'm jealous. Don't be jealous. The same God that will give them a trip to Hawaii will give you one. Are you stepping out in faith? Are you blessing all those around you? Are you getting along with people? Are you bringing all of your problems to the Lord or are you hanging on to them and worrying about them? What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about what is true and noble and lovely and a virtue and praiseworthy or are you thinking about all the junk in the world? Keep your mind focused on the Lord. Find someone else whose mind is focused on the Lord. Ask them how they do it. And when you have a problem and you feel yourself being drawn back into that negativity, call them and say, I need some help here. Pull me out of this. Verse 20. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And he finishes it off by saying this. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. He's talking again to the pastor. A lot of times in our church services, I will have people go find someone that they don't know. So I'm just going to take a minute, and I'm going to ask you, everybody, to stand up, look around, and if they're wearing a mask, you can wave, but find somebody that you don't know. Is there anybody here that you don't know? Go greet them. Say hello. Say the Lord bless you. If you know them, greet them anyway. These ladies over here need to be greeted. If you're at home, 
figure out what friend you're going to call when this is over. What friend are you going to call just to say, I love you in the Lord, keep going in the faith. All right? All right now, ladies, you can stop greeting. All right, we are the greetingest people in the world. Greet this lady here, Danny. <clears throat> All right, let's finish this part up because we want to hear what Miss Holly has to say. Then Paul finished by saying, they're still greeting over here. Those of you that are watching and don't know why I'm stalling, it's because they're still. All right, ladies, end the conversation. Let's finish up now. Here we go. Nope, they're still talking. Still chatting, still greeting, still blessing. Okay, now they're hugging. Okay, here we go. Paul said, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Now, why in the world would he say those who are of Caesar's household? Because he had been sent to Rome to stand trial. He was going to be tried by Caesar himself, by the emperor of the entire world. He was about to be tried and possibly put to death. He wasn't. But while he was in Rome, you know what he did? He started a church. And he went into the people, the servants of the emperor himself, and he witnessed to them, and they gave their lives to Jesus. And it says that he had a house in Rome, and people would come and visit him, and he would tell them about Jesus. And some of them were Roman soldiers, centurions. I was watching the movie Gladiator the other night, thinking about those Roman soldiers coming to Paul and getting born again. Wow. So even though he was there and had to stay there and was under house arrest, he was still, still preaching the gospel. Wow. And then the last thing he says is the grace, the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Now just greeting each other, didn't that make you feel good? Didn't that lift up your spirits? All right. Okay. Would you please welcome my dear friend, Miss Holly Leary, Valenzuela. <laughs> well, praise God. Let's stay in Philippians 4 for a moment. And I'm reading from the Amplified Classic. Uh, and so the wording's a little bit different. But I want to look at uh, ver chapter 4, verse 13. And it says, in the Amplified Classic, I have strength for all things. Now, if you ever feel like life is pressing in on you, I suggest that you take a piece of paper, title it, All Things, and just make a list. Let's get it out of our brain and onto the paper. Let's get it, let's externalize it. That's a psychological word. Put it on a piece of paper so we can look at it and it doesn't feel like it's inside of us just uh, making everything toxic. Because it says here in this verse, I have strength for all things. So what are these all things? These all things, they change from day to day, week to week, month to month. And so we are always having the opportunity to deal with maybe a circumstance for the very first time. Or maybe it's a circumstance that happens over and over and over again. And there can be a discourage to, to that when something keeps showing up in our lives. Or maybe someone we love, it keeps showing up in their lives. But if we don't faint in due season, we will reap. Now let's look at the rest of the verse. Philippians 4.13, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. 
So where does that empowerment come from? Who do I spend the most time with? Is it my husband? Is it my good friend? Is it my adult child? Is it my grandkid? Well, how about if it's El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough? How about if I log in more time with him so that as I move through these all things, in him I live and move and have my being. In him, tucked in him, like it says in Psalms 91. She who abides in the shadow of the Almighty shall remain fixed immovable and stable and so in him I move now when I came here this morning I drove our car now if I had walked here this morning I probably by now would be somewhere on Mockingbird Canyon you know so I get in the vehicle that will get me there and his presence his strength his equipping, his peace, is the vehicle that will get me there. And sometimes we just start out walking. Well, bless God, I'm going to do this, you know. And it's like, did I connect with El Shaddai? Did I plug into my power source? I'm like that little electric car that has to plug in. I have to fill, fill, fill it up. And be strong in the power of his might, the scripture says. All right, let me try and finish this verse. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him. God, I repent of my whining. I repent of my, of my complaining. I, com I repent of every thought where I look at myself through the lens of the past. You know, I've uh, said my husband and I, we teach a Sunday school class here at Bethel um, at 9 a.m. on Sundays. I'm not the person I was in the 70s. In the 70s, I was a scaredy cat. I mean, I was literally afraid of my own shadow. I mean, I was afraid of everything. I had a relationship with God. I love God with all my heart. And I did not yet know how to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I came to church on a wing and a prayer, so to speak, hoping that something outside of me would fix me. But it's an inside job. And as I learned to live in him and have my being in him, I began to get stronger and stronger on the inside. I remember uh, Pastor Rhonda, this is uh, so many years back, but one of the first responsibilities I was approached with at Bethel, your mom asked me to be a greeter of, out in the foyer. Uh, my first husband and I, would you be greeters? Oh my God, you mean I have to talk to every single person that walks in that door? What will I say? Well, she told me just say hi, glad you're here today. Glad you're here today. And it took me over a month to say yes. And I was, we used to come up to the altar at the end of the service and pray. And I was boohooing in front of God. Oh, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I can do this. And just like, you know, what if, what, what if I forget what to say? I mean, I was a real scaredy cat back then. <laughs> but faithful is he. Oh, wait, let me get to, no, let's go to uh, Philippians 1.6. I'll come back to this verse because I'm about to qu quote Philippians 1.6. And here's my growing up verse because I think it's so amazing the adventure that you and I are on, the God who changes not, who says in the word, I change not calls us each individually to a life of change that we might go from glory to glory to glory. 
by the power of his might, by the relational peace that's at work within us, talking to us all the time. That's a powerful thing. You know, I remember uh, in January of 2018, God had me really, really envisioning uh, my 70s. And at first, all I knew was that it was going to be great. And I kept saying, Lord, thank you for my 70s. They're going to be great. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I did not know that a son that had difficulty with drugs and alcohol most of his adult life was going to come into rehab and is now celebrating his 19th month of sobriety and a, a blessing to the whole family. My goodness, my husband and I, we have a Bible study in our home every other Wednesday morning and he comes and I told him, if you don't speak up, I'm your mama, you're going to bring us home with the last thought of the day. And if he hasn't said something, I say, well, what are your thoughts? And he always has something to say, and we're always blessed by it. So in my 70s, and God told me a long time ago, maybe like seven or eight years ago, don't worry about their 30s. Everything's going to level out in their 40s. You just abide in me. And so two of them are in their 40s now, and one of them's circling 40 and getting closer there every day. And I have a beautiful, wonderful daughter whose life was filled with chaotic circumstances. It just seemed like all the time. And she has become so established in the past year. She's just a blessing. I'm strengthened by her. And it's just wonderful. And I didn't know all these things were going to happen in my 70s, but I thank God for it. So now what am I doing? Am I, am I still thinking about my 70s? No, I'm praying about my 80s. And I'm praying about my 90s. So if you know me, you better plan to know me for a long time. <laughs> Length of days and a life worth living. Why? Let's look at Philippians 1, 6. And I am convinced and sure of this very thing. I too am convinced. You know, each and every one of us, we have all different kinds of relationships. I have a relationship with my church here. And it's not the same relationship that I have with my heavenly father. And I thought the two were the same thing. I thought if somebody at church disapproved of me, that must mean God disapproved of me. I thought if someone at church didn't think that I was uh, able to do something, that meant God didn't think I was able to do something. And so I was defining God by what I saw and heard from his people. But we're all going from glory to glory to glory. And so now, and for a long time, my focus has been on me. What is God saying to me? What is God doing in me? So that I might have a better message in what I say and do with my life to everyone around me. So Philippians 1.6, I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. We are that good work. I am that good work. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of, of, of light in whom there's no variables, no shadow of turning in him. I think I just mixed a couple translations together there. Um, and I have a real simple saying, if it, if it ain't good, it ain't God. Right? Heaven is full of love. And if it isn't in heaven... Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in my walk. May it be done unto me according to thy will. And so my walk every day, every moment of it, is an opportunity for me to grow and learn 
change what I say, change, not just change what I do, because many of us, we have things that we do, you know, all the time. I mean, I've been making my bed since I was a little girl. That hasn't changed. But how I go about it now is much more cheerful. And so we have an opportunity to brighten up. In, um, uh, I'm not going to go to this first, but in Luke chapter 1, verse 79, it says, those that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Has it been dark in any area where you just can't part the clouds or you just can't see where to go or you just can't figure out how to swim or navigate or climb out of this? Those that dark, sat in darkness have seen a great light. Lord, what's your light? In you I live and move and have my being. You are the light of the world. And you call me to be an example of that light. And so I, I come back to my relationship with him. And uh, when we praise him and worship him, there's a word that means to brighten up. And so his effect on me is that I become brighter. And the brighter, the better. Okay, so back to um, Philippians 6, chapter 1, verse 6. I'm very convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Now, I like to pair that with uh, Philippians verse 13. Let's look at Philippians 2 verse 13. Because if I only read uh, chapter 1 verse 6, I might go, oh my God. Oh my God, I, wow, I just got to work so hard at this. I got to be so perfect. I got to make, I got to always say the right thing. I got to always do the right thing. And um, the blessings of God are just, I just feel like it's all on my shoulders. And, but no, because we are in him, it's on his shoulders to fulfill his word. See, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant which is an agreement between two, God and man came into agreement. Well, the whole testament is full of examples of man slipping and sliding around and, you know, making all kinds of mistakes. Have you ever, have you ever had an oops? Where you go, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't done that. You know, things like that. But then the new covenant is a more sure covenant. Why? Because it is God the Father and God the Son in agreement. And there's no slipping and sliding with that. So any time, at any moment, I can experience what I call the hammock of grace. Because it's one of the few things we're supposed to labor to enter into. It's the rest. Over in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks all about labor to enter into the rest. Well, what does that mean? Well, gosh, what am I, what am I, what, where is all my energy going? Well, I'm worrying about this, and I've got to fix this, and i got to, I got to, you know, they're messing up. i got to go give them a piece of my mind. Well, what's so great about my mind that someone should have a piece of it? If you think about it, a lot of times that's just two unrenewed minds talking to each other, right? Okay, so in Philippians 2.13... Not in your own strength. So we come back to grace. We get in the hammock of grace and we rest. We rest in his word. We rest in his presence. We rest in our imperfectness. Even though we know through sanctification all things are made perfect. But I'm also well aware of where I am on this journey of change. So not in your own strength... For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. For his good pleasure. You know, we're all at different stages of development. We all are going through different things. You might not always be pleased with me, although it would be my desire that I would fit in with the body of Christ in ways that are pleasing. But when I put my head on the pillow at night, what I want to hear more than anything is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's who I um, report to. That's who I connect with. And like, like, uh, like Rhonda, I will not say anything about anyone else's ministry or their calling because the scripture talks about not judging another man's servant. And we are servants of God. And, and then as an outflow of that, we direct uh, our, what we say and do toward others. And it's a byproduct of our relationship with him. Now, um, sometimes the way can get really tough. You know, have you been through a, something and it just feels so challenging, so uphill? It's like, Lord, give me some hiking boots or something. This is tough. This is so uphill. And that's the challenge to stay in him at that point. Anybody can be pleasant on a good day, right? But what happens when we're feeling the squeeze of circumstances? When uh, this is part of the be thankful in all things. Lord, I thank you the answer's on the way. I thank you there's strength in your word. I thank you that you will give to me all things related to godliness and to life and to peace. And sometimes we have very challenging circumstances. So one of the skills offered to us in the word of God is resiliency. The ability to get back up. Yes, I'm circumstance aware. I see that difficulty. I see that challenge. But I am not circumstance led. I'm not going to organize my thoughts around the problem. I'm not going to organize my emotions around the problem. But I'm looking to God to guide me what is my part in the solution. Now, my part is rarely ever 100% of the solution. I may have a little part. I may have a big part. I may, I may have a prayer part. I may have a doing good works part. I may have a compassion part. I may have a wisdom part. And it can change, you know, from different circumstances, whatever they are. But first, I have to be in alignment I have to be in agreement with myself. Remember, I'm a spirit. You're a spirit. I live in a body. You live in a body. And I have a soul. And you have a soul. And so when all three are in alignment, then I move forward in unity and single-mindedness of purpose. Now, the, um, the emotions are centered primarily in the body because of the proteins and the hormones that create them in our bodies. Our thoughts are centered in our brain. We've been just talking about this in our Sunday school class. And different thoughts produce different chemicals. And those chemicals go into the body and produce different emotions. And if I can't, if I don't remember the thought that produced the emotion, that just means it's, it's habitual, it's automatic for me. Now, back in the 70s, I was a scaredy cat. And so I began to immerse myself in relationship with God the Father and know that he had not given me a spirit of fear. 
but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I didn't focus a lot on what is fear. I focused on what's power? How is power delivered to me through the word of God? How is love delivered through me according to the word of God? And then what is this business of a sound mind, whole, complete, stable, fixed? And how does all that work? And so you may have had or are having other challenges. For me, it was fear and anxiety. And so we have the opportunity as the decades go by to make progress. It even says in the Bible that we will make progress on our high places of testing and trial and responsibility. So the Bible's telling us, hey, there's going to be some steep climbs in your life, you know, and God is there with us. God guides us. God goes before us. He watches our backside. He's all around us. He's within us. And so if I'm looking at the problem, my rule of thumb is to spend two or three times the amount of energy looking at the solution. If I'm not sure what the solution is, then I'm praying in the spirit, I'm spending time in his word, I'm in thankfulness. Lord, I thank you that the answer will come. Yesterday, my husband and I had some unexpected circumstances with a bit of a price tag to it. And uh, so we needed to uh, make decisions. You know, we, need to make de we needed to make decisions yesterday. And so uh, we talked a couple of times. And I said, well, the power of agreement's the most important thing we have right now to put into this. You know, and we were talking about all of it. And we made a bold decision that was above and beyond our circumstances. And I, I said, all I can tell you is it's going to be fine. And every fiber of my, feet, of my being knew that. It's going to be fine. You know, I spent a long time, many years, working with a trauma therapist uh, dealing with... Uh, a, a, a history, a pretty significant history of childhood abuse. And so it took time to walk that on out. And uh, my first Christian therapist taught me um, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. So I'm not pretending I'm not afraid, but I have an action plan for when I am. My second therapist when I no longer needed a, a specialist, that was a, a great day for our finances. And then I found a local therapist, and she taught me every day, in every way, it just keeps getting better and better. And it's a very, very powerful thing when my brain, my physical brain, Here's my voice. It's very powerful what I say. It's like my brain. There are files in my brain. There's a fear file. There's a peace file. There's a love file, you know, because of my own growth over the years. So if I start talking the problem, my brain will open up the fear file and start shooting chemicals that could caused me now to begin to deal with some anxiety. If I'm talking power, the power of God is present to heal. Heal me, Lord, of all this. Then the healing file and the message goes out to my cells in my body. Be healed. Be recovered. Be strengthened. Be well nourished. Be whole. And so what I say isn't just some legalistic thing. I'm queuing up my brain for how I want my body to go. And so we have so many ways 
to move through circumstances in a more powerful way. We have so many ways to be strong in the power of his might. And it's our relationship with him. Relationship must undergird responsibility. Every problem in our lives is a responsibility to handle appropriately, whether I'm 5% of the solution or 95%. And so I can focus on doing my part, my part, my part. So that I, my mind is free to meditate on the things whatsoever is of a good report. And that's what provides the health for me physically. Because as I'm moving in him, my life is less stressed. Doesn't mean there aren't stressors all around me. I mean, look at the examples of in the Old Testament when they were in battle. Look at Gideon, what brought confidence to him? Look at Joshua, what brought confidence to him? Look at Samson, what brought confidence to him? Look at Deborah, what brought confidence to her? So it's not that there's no battle around us. It's that in him we live and move and have our being. Amen? I'll turn it back to Pastor Rhonda. Ooh, okay. Hallelujah. Check, check. All right. I want to show uh, Mary that scripture, Philippians 2.13. Show us that in the New King James, and we'll stay apart so we don't feed back. And I'm looking at the camera, and, and we did really well with what we wore today. I know. We didn't call each other to check ahead of time. <laughs> For it is God who works in you both to will and to do. For his good pleasure. Amen. He works in you both to will, meaning that he will give you the desire and the will and the motivation to do what it is that he wants you to do. This is a huge thing to me. A minister that I just love to watch on TV is Creflo Dollar, and he says it this way, God will change your want to's. If you let him, God will change your want to's. So that you won't even want to do that thing that messes you up. And you will want to do the things that are pleasing to him. You will want that more than anything. And it becomes less and less and less of a struggle to do right because you have his desire inside of you. So thank you for pulling that verse up. When you pulled it up and I looked at it, I went, oh yeah, that, that's something that made it, meant a lot to me. Amen. All right. Well, Holly, I'm going to ask you to close the live stream session in prayer. Okay. And then, ladies, I have some things to talk to you a little bit about after we stop the live stream. So let's pray. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that it's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Yes. And the kingdom is peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. And we thank you, Lord, for your spirit that moves in our lives. And right now... Right in this moment, we create and receive an oasis of surrender where we surrender to you and all your goodness, God. We say yes to your goodness. We say yes to your love. We say yes to your strength. We say yes to your health. We say yes to your peace. We say yes to your prosperity in our lives. And we thank you, Father God, that you walk with us as we walk with you and together we can put all things in order. And we thank you, Father, that dispersed in our lives are the answers already for all things are possible. So even in this very atmosphere today, I believe it is full of answers. And as we reach up to you, we receive guidance and we receive your word and we receive your strength. And we move forward making progress on our high places of testing and trial and responsibility. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right.